Which church do you belong to? We've been talking for the last few weeks about the importance of the church and how much the church, I say the church, I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about the corporate body of Christ. I'm talking about all of those who identify with, I am a child of God, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, He's the Lord of my life. Those That, that group of people make up the church. Uh, it's called the body of Christ. We're all members of one body, just like your body's made up of many members, your fingers and hands and toes and nose and your eyes and ears and and all of your parts that come together to make up you. So the body of Christ is is all of these people globally that come together. So in, in saying that, uh, if you recognize I'm a member of the body, then that should rule out all prejudices in your life. Because if I'm members of the same body, how can my fingers say to my ear, you don't look like me. Therefore, you must be less important than me. You must be less anything than me just because of the way you look and a different way that you perform. I, I think that we really miss it. You know, Natalie and I were talking last night, and I was talking about how awesome God is. We were talking about the understanding. Here we go. We're not even on that anymore. <laughs> we were talking about how, how what is it that, in, that stirs you to recognize the awesomeness of God? Amen. Because honestly, that word awesome, we use it way too much. And it's, it's, it means I'm struck with so much awe, it leaves, it, it leaves me speechless, Amen. is what that word means. I'm so overwhelmed that I'm speechless, that I can't even find the words. That's what awesome means. So we, we, we really overuse that word, and it's really, it's probably we should be reserved for God alone. Because there's nothing else other than God and the things that he's done that leave me speechless. So, we were talking about what is it that, that inspires you to, to acknowledge the awesomeness of God. And I was telling her that for me it's the stars. When I walk outside at night, and you know, especially right now because all the street lights are gone. Thank God. I don't like them. I like to walk outside at night to see the stars mm -hmm. and not be distracted by the lights. But, you know, when I walk out, especially like when we had the, the West Texas deer lease and stuff, and you can walk out where you're miles from really a light and just look up and the stars, if you've never seen that, get away somewhere. Mm -hmm. Get away from town. Get, get out in the middle of nothingness for a while and look up. Because if you if you look from in town, you don't know what the stars look like. Right. Right. You really don't. Mm -hmm. But if you get away from the lights and you look up and you see these millions of lights, and that, that we can't even fathom the vastness, and and that that's that's so small on a galactic scale to what's there. So when I look up and I see that, my mind just starts exploring how big my God is that He created this. And it, the expanse is millions and billions of light years away, and, and there's no end to it. It goes on forever, and you look it up at some of these, these lights in the cosmos that are bigger than the planet you're standing on, and it's just overwhelming. It's, it's awesome. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we talked, I told her, that, that that does it. Then being out in nature, and you just look at the birds. Yes. Look at the color in them. The look at the color just in the birds. There again, if you're not out in nature, get there. Mm -hmm. So you can see the handiwork of God. But all of these birds are different colors. And, mm -hmm. but, and we can recognize the beauty in that. And we can recognize the, the penmanship of God, the, art, the artistry of God in that. Mm -hmm. But we don't recognize it in the human race. Mm -hmm. We fail to see the beauty in the colors. And the differences and the contrast and the <coughs> how boring would it be if everybody was just like me? How pitiful that everybody would be. You know how boring that would be. As interesting as I am, <laughs> if we were all the same, that would get mundane, right? Just think if everybody was like you. <laughs> uh -oh. yeah. Sorry, I'm not. Think about that. Think about 
everybody is like you. Look, I'm thankful that not everybody thinks like me. I'm glad that everybody doesn't have the same opinion. There's some I wish did have the same opinions. But you know, without anything to question what I think, I would never even be sure of what I think. If there was never a challenge to what I think, I would never even dig deeper into think, try to figure out why I think this way. If there was not a challenge to it, So, anyway, where was I? Oh, we've been talking about since one. Good. We're on since one. We've been talking about for the last few weeks the importance of the church and the love that God has for the church and how important the church is to God. Because to God, church is, I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the corporate body. Oh, I know where I was talking, talking about the, the, the differences in the body. But recognize that every part of this body is important. They may not look like you, they may not sound like you, they may not worship like you, but if they're worshiping Jehovah God through Jesus, they're part of our body. Yes. I'm not talking about every religion because there, there's a difference. I'm talking about the worship of Father God through the blood of Jesus, right. through this, his son Jesus that was right. sacrificed for us. Mm -hmm. We're part of one body. We may worship differently. We may look different. We may sound different. But recognize and appreciate appreciate the differences. So God bought us, the church, with the highest price that's ever been paid for every, anything, right? We've talked about that for the last few weeks. So an understanding of the importance of the church, I want us to look at seven letters that Jesus wrote to the church. He wrote seven letters through John the Revelator, through a vision. He gave John the Revelator a vision to write seven letters to seven specific churches in seven specific cities. Okay? So recognize that, that in this is in the book of Revelation chapter 2, that John's writing these letters by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to seven specific churches in seven specific cities. But that was then. But now for us, what's it mean? Well, what the Lord showed me was these seven churches represent seven different people or seven types of people in the church or seven places where people in the church are. So in those seven letters, somewhere in there, you're going to find yourself. And this is where I am. And this is what God's writing to me right now. Well, the thing about these seven letters were, for the most part, they were correction. Okay? So what you're going to see in them is Jesus starts talking, and first of all, he identifies himself with each of these seven churches in a different way. He identifies himself as, as, in different ways to these seven churches because they're all in a different place. And I'm not talking about geographically, I'm talking about spiritually. They're in a different place in their life. And he's dealing, and then he starts out by admonishing them and saying, hey, this is the thing, you're doing these things right. These are the things that you're doing, and man, you are right on the money. But then there's always a but. Mm -hmm. But I do have a problem with this. Now let's deal with this. So he points out their, their area of deficiency and not, not in all of them, but in most of them. He points out the areas that they got to get some things right. And then he said, if you do, here's the reward for it. Okay? So I want us to look at these letters, but keep Keep all of that in mind, that, that hey, Jesus is, is talking to seven people or seven, seven churches, but somewhere in these seven churches is me. And that's why I asked the question, which church do you belong to? So I, I said that in each one he described himself by different attributes of, of himself. 
And for each one, it was because that's what they needed. All right? So he was the spirit of, spirit of life to the dead church. And he was the spirit uh, of, he was the one with the sword coming out of his mouth for the, for the ones that weren't doing exactly right and needed some, they were compromising. Okay? So just keep that in mind. But in each, why did he do that? Because remember what he called himself to Moses? Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Well, God, who do I tell him? This is the king, God. Who do I go to him and say, who, uh, who sent me? He's going to want to know, who sent me? Well, tell him I am sent you. <laughs> Wait a minute, God. I'm fixing to go before the king. And who do you want me to tell him sent me? I am. What does he mean by that? He means I am. What do you need? That's what I am. Well, God, I need a savior. Well, I am your savior. God, I, I need a healer. Well, I am your healer. I need a restorer. Well, I am your restorer. I need a provider. I am your provider. On and on and on. So in each one of these things, when he points out the, their area of deficiency, he said, but, but, but wait, I am that. And if you turn back to me, I'll give you that. And then you receive a reward for it. But I am exactly the answer to your every issue. Yes. I am the answer that you need. Amen. Like I said, I don't know how far we're going to get into this, but wherever we leave off, we'll probably continue. I'm not going to say we will, because I'm following by, by willful obedience, right? Just got into all that. So, But the plan for now is to pick up right there next week. So as we go through this, um, you know, I, I, I've heard people who are afraid to read the book of Revelation. And not because of what it says, but because they say, I can't understand it. But I, I want you to know this. If, if God didn't feel it was very important for him to tell you these things, he wouldn't have put that book in the Bible. And he wouldn't have put it there if you don't have the ability to understand it. Now, I will say this. In the natural, you don't have the ability to understand it. It's going to take the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. Amen. Okay? So what you have to do, and, and this is what you should do, honestly, with every book of the Bible. Before you open it, say, Holy Spirit, I submit myself to you. And look, you don't have to pray these words, but something like this. I submit myself to you. I'm going to read your word right now, Father. But what I ask of you is that you reveal the word to me in truth. And then that's one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is the, the revealer. All right? Okay. So... I'm just going to, this is just a cursory overview of these, of these letters. We're not going to get into an in-depth study because honestly we could go weeks on each one of the letters. But we're going to do a, a brief overview, but I'm going to encourage you to dig into it a little deeper. Yes. Study it. Read it and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things to you anyway, which is what we should be doing anyway. All right, the first letter. Starting in verse 1. Chapter, this is Revelation 2. We're going to start in verse 1. So we're going to go through verse 7. But this is a letter. Well, we're going to, yeah. This is a letter to the church that's called the Loveless Church. The Loveless Church. Now remember, he's writing to a specific church. But now that's to each of us. So I have to ask myself, do I, am I a member of this church? The Loveless Church. To the angel at the church of Ephesus. Right. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. See, that's how Jesus identified himself right there. Who walks in the midst of the seven lampstands, golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you could not bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say that they're apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. See, he's pointing out all the things that they're doing right. And look, they're doing a lot of stuff right. Man, they, this church got it going on. But then he's, there's that big word. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have lost or left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, 
Repent. Do the first works. He's saying, look, get back to the foundation. What, what are you doing this for? All these works that you're doing, why are you doing them? What's your purpose? What's your motivation? Get back to that. Get back to the foundation, which should be your salvation. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. What's the lampstand? He said, I am the God that walks. I'm the one who walks in the midst of the golden lampstand. What's he talking about? He's talking about this church. And he's saying, I walk among you. It's my anointing there. My anointing's there with you. But if you don't make some changes, I'm going to remove the anointing. Whoa. Mm, serious. Dear God. I'm going to remove the anointing. So then all you have left is emotion. Unless you repent. But this you have. That you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. <laughs> the Nicolaitans. Which I also hate. Now I want you to see what Jesus said he hated. He didn't say he hated them. He said he hated their deeds. You understand that? We have to be careful with that. You have to separate the people from what they do. You understand? You can hate what people do, but I would encourage you not to hate the people. Amen. Because remember, Jesus died for them too. No matter what they're doing, you can just like what they do, but you still have to love them. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God tree of life. He said, man, I'll let you. That tree that was in the Garden of Eden that I told Adam and Eve they could eat from, man, I'll let you eat from that. I'll let you taste of it. I'll show you things. That's revelation. I'll show you <clears throat> things you've never seen before. I'll open my word up to you like never before, but you got to first love me. you got to love me. So here's a church that had everything going right. Man, their programs were spot on. They, they, they had outreach ministries going on. They were feeding the hungry. They were doing all kind of work out there, and things were going good. But they didn't love Jesus. It didn't say they lost their love. It said they left their love. So the love of God was no longer their motivation. You see what I'm saying? The love of God was no longer that motivation. Let me tell you something. When, when you lose the love of God, you become a bitter, judgmental person. So when you see someone who's bitter, judgmental, fault-finding, highly critical of other people, and what I'm saying, when you find someone, I'm talking about look internally. Don't look out there for them. Look in here to see if this is the church you belong to. Because what that means is, what that shows is, you lost your love for Jesus. You might love the things of God, but do you have a love of God? Do you have a love for God? Do you have a passionate love for God? See, the things I passionately love, I passionately pursue. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm a passionate person. The things that I love, I passionately pursue. To an extreme sometimes. Way too often to an extreme. And i got to try to bring things back in. Because when I have a love for it, I'm not going to do it halfway. I'm going to pursue it. Right, Natalie? Right. <laughs> but listen, the word of God, without the love of God, it's very harsh and judgmental. See, that's why last week I struggled so much to bring that message. I didn't want to bring that message. And there's a lot of them like that. That when I'm writing them, they seem so harsh and judgmental. But when they come forth, they come forth with the love of God, so therefore they're not. Amen. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So if we try to bring the word, and when I say bring the word, I'm not necessarily just talking about preaching. 
I'm talking about when we go out there and we live it and we're trying to be an example of Jesus. If we have that without the love of God in our heart, we are going to be a judgmental, hypercritical person. And it's going to turn people off. And you ever known a Christian like that? Brighten up a room by leaving. <laughs> Is that supposed to be how we are? No, we're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. But you ever try to eat something with too much salt? Makes you sick, doesn't it? So is the Christian who shares the word without the love. Even Paul said the letter kills. But you got to have the love behind it. So he talked about, I want to get some light because he starts out these letters with, to the angel of the church at Ephesus. So that's the, the, the common uh, belief about this, the, the interpretation of this is, he's talking to the, to the pastor there. So in our modern vernacular, it would maybe sound like this, to the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Okay? So I just wanted to kind of clear that up. I'm not saying that because I'm the pastor, therefore I must be angelic. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that's how this is written. Or some theologians believe that he's talking to the angel that was placed in in dominionship over that body. It could be both. It could be either or it could be both. Then when he says to the church of Ephesus, these things are right to those who hold the seven stars, that's that's churches. That's the seven churches. He calls them stars. He said, I hold them in my right hand like a star. Goes back to the love that Jesus has for the church. First off, that he calls them stars and relates them that way. Well, what is a star? It's a light shining bright in the darkness. See? Thus should be the church. Okay? So then he says, I hold them in my right hand. Well, the right hand is the hand of power and authority. So God said, I hold them right here. And I protect them. We'll think about that before we bash the church. I hold them in my right hand, my hand of power and authority. I exercise my authority over them. I protect them. I provide for them. I hold them right here. And so that's a picture of how much the church means to Jesus. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we talked about his... The seven golden lampstands representing his presence in the church, not the building, but the body. And it's a picture of the anointing. So Jesus was saying that this church was doing everything right outwardly. They were doing works all over and all their community services and all of that were doing great. But the problem was they lost their love. They didn't lose it. They left it. They got away from what was important. They got away from loving Jesus. That should be our fundamental in everything. The love of Jesus. That should be why. That should be my answer to why of everything. Why are you doing this? Well, it should be because I love Jesus. And if that's not the reason I'm doing it, then that's, I'm, I'm doing it for the wrong reason. Remind me of that. They did all the right things just for the wrong reason. Things become become done, or we begin to do things sometimes out of tradition and out of rote. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Amen. So when we come together in our worship, in the way we conduct our services, in the way we live our lives, if we're not careful, we become a very traditional people. And we start asking, we have to ask ourselves, why do I do this? Okay? Why do I do this, and why do I do it this way? No matter what it is. But we can get so caught up in the traditional way of doing things that we really miss God, and that goes back to what I was talking about earlier about following through willful obedience. Okay? Y'all with me? Yes. Y'all follow what I'm talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we can even come together and sing our songs and raise our hands and Say amen, hallelujah, praise God. And really not be doing it because we love Jesus. It's 
just because that's what we do when we come to church. Y'all get that? Mm -hmm. yes. So the problem becomes then if, if I'm not doing it because I love Jesus, well, I'm doing it for the wrong reason. And this, this is actually the church that I belong to. The loveless church. So Natalie pointed out to me yesterday this uh, illustration of this, this very good illustration with Peter. When Jesus shows up and he's talking to Peter, Peter's fishing. Y'all know the story? Peter's been fishing all night and he didn't catch anything. And Jesus said, throw your net on the other side. And then Peter starts this argument with God. But God, Jesus, you, look, I'm going to paraphrase. <laughs> Jesus, I don't mean to be offensive, but you a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. I've been doing this my whole life, Jesus. I'm a fisherman. My daddy was a fisherman. My grandpa, he was a fisherman too. I've been well trained. I've been trained by the best, Jesus, in exactly how to do this. And Jesus, I don't know if you noticed, but it's daylight. I just told you, I've been fishing all night. And that's when we fish, Jesus. But Jesus said, but, but Peter, throw you down on the other side. Jesus, that's the right side. Everybody knows we fish on the left side. Why do you fish on the left side, Peter? Because that's the way I was trained, Jesus. Daddy fished on the left side. Grandpa, he fished on the left side. We all fish on the left side, and that's the right way to do it. Anybody that don't do it that way, does it sound familiar? Maybe not in fishing. Everyday life. But in life, in church, why do you do that? <laughs> that's just the way you do it. Why? That's how my mom and them did it. Grandma did it that way. Grandpa did it that way. Hey, it worked for them. Mm -hmm. It's the way I've always done it. Mm -hmm. Tradition by rote. Or is it because I follow Jesus? And this is because this is what God told me to do. And this is how He showed me to do it. So Jesus said, All right, Peter, for just a second, let's try something different. Let's do something you never dared to do. Hey, Peter, let's fish in the daylight. Mm -hmm. hmm. Never considered that, God. And let's fish off the right side of the boat, Peter. So Peter throws his nets over the right side, and what happens? So many fish, they start sinking the boats, right? They, he's calling his buddies, come help. I can't get these nets in. Nets are breaking. And there's about 15 different sermons in that story. But we're going with the tradition and doing things by rote just because that's the way we've always done it. One side represents grace and the other side represents judgment. The left side where he always fished, that represented judgment. But Jesus said, hey, we, we get into a dispensation of grace and we're going to fish a different way. Okay? So we have to be willing to follow Jesus because we love him, not just because... This is the way it's always been done. Y'all catching this? Yes. Get back to the foundations. Jesus said to them, repent. Come back to your first love. Fall in love with me all over again. I'm going to tell you this. If you don't love Jesus, if you don't have a burning passion for Jesus, you've never really seen him. And I'm not talking about with your physical eyes. But you've never had a revelation of him. You don't know what he did for you. You don't know the price. You don't, first of all, you don't even know who he is. And you don't know, you don't have a good revelation of what he did. Because if you have a real revelation of what he did for you, you can't help but love him. Why would you? You ain't never going to get to this. How would you feel about the person if you were guilty of murder, you killed someone. No good reason, you just did it. And you're on death row. And your day of execution comes. And they go to put you in that chair. 
and someone steps up and says, wait a minute, let him go. I'll take his spot in the chair. And then you learn that the one who took your spot in the chair was the son of the man that you killed. How would you feel about that guy? So much more is it that Jesus went to the cross for you. So much more. Because it was more than just a murder. It was your lifetime of sin. The ones that you committed, the ones you hadn't even done yet. You hadn't even thought about doing them yet. But he died for them too. He died for the sins of the world from Adam to when the last man takes his last breath. All of the sin of the world was placed upon him. Have you ever felt guilty when you did something wrong? You know what guilt feels like? Guilt will torment you to death. It will literally torment you to death. The feeling of guilt. I can't imagine the guilt that somebody has to feel when they've done some of the horrific things that we see on the news. All right? Now, I understand that they've been callous to it. It didn't start there usually. It usually started small, and as they became more and more calloused, it built up to these horrific acts. But Jesus had never sinned. There was no callousing of his heart. He was in perfect communion with the Father. Okay? Blameless, sinless. Completely, sin was so foreign to him, he never even knew what it felt like. He was in perfect communion with the Father, and their relationship had never been severed or even distorted by sin. Okay? I know we can't even fathom this, but that's how he was. Then he goes to the cross and at one time becomes guilty of every sin ever committed. And all of the feelings of guilt that any person could ever feel fell upon a heart that was completely uncallous to it. And then, because of the sin that separates us from God, he now loses his relationship with his father completely. And he looks up and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If there's ever been a time I needed you, Father, it's now, and now you've turned your back on me. And God says, I have to. Because you've taken their guilt. You've taken their forsakenness. You've taken their rejection. You've taken it all. Now, if you can't see him for who he is, you'll never love him. But once you see him for who he is, you can't help but love him. Because he did for you what no one else could do. See, sin came into the world through a man. Right? right? So the only way sin could be dealt with was through a man. So a man lost it. A man had to get it back. But it couldn't be a mortal man because every mortal man fell under the guilt of sin. So it had to be a God man. Amen. Another 15 part sermon that we'll get to one day maybe. So that's the loveless church. Get back to your first love. Man, that, this, this to, for me has been so real. Every time I walk outside and I see what's left of my house, what's left is just a foundation. It's all that's there. So everything that was built on it wasn't strong enough, so it fell. You with me? Mm -hmm. So it goes back to, but the foundation was solid. So my foundation has to be my salvation in Christ. Amen. Now what I build on that, it may fall. Yes. But what we get back to is what's not broken. And that's the foundation. Right. And we build upon that if you will. See? Mm -hmm. All right. The loveless church. So if, if you look at yourself and you say, man, I can identify. I've lost my love. I've left my love. I've walked out on my, the love of my life. I'm talking about Jesus. I've walked out. I've 
I, somehow along the way, I may not have even realized I did it, but somewhere along the way, I got away from the love that I once had for God. Well, he said, repent and come back to me. Fall in love with me all over again. Sounds like a country song. <laughs> Fall in love with me all over again. Well, what makes you fall in love with somebody? What made me fall in love with her? It wasn't the first time I saw her. That's when I fell in love for her. It took time of getting to know her that caused me to love her. All the rest of that is, is a physical thing. Okay? Do I believe in love at first sight? I don't. I think we have a, an emotion. <clears throat> when I saw her, there was no doubt. There was an emotion. There was a feeling. Right? Mm -hmm. But I, I really didn't get to love her until over years I got to know her. And the more I get to know her, the more I love her. And that's how it is with God. You may have come to an altar, you may have gone to an altar at a moment where you felt an emotion, but that doesn't mean you fell in love with him. You only fall in love with him as you get to know him. And you only get to know him through reading his word and spending time with him in prayer and letting him speak to you and you get to know who this God really is. Mm -hmm. If that's you, start exploring who he is so you can fall in love with him all over again. Amen? Amen. The persecuted church. Revelation 2, 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, Smyrna, right? These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and who came to life. Remember who he's talking to. These people are under persecution. They're being killed for their love of God. And Jesus said, I'm the one who was dead and came back to life. I'm the first and the last. I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty, although you were rich. You see, you can be rich and still be in poverty. And you can be in poverty and be rich. Because honestly, wealth doesn't make you rich. It makes you wealthy. You know, there was a company I worked for that, that the owner of that company was a multi-billionaire. Not only was he a multi-billionaire, he was an Olympic gold medalist. That's like two of the greatest victories, you know, becoming super wealthy and being an Olympic gold medalist. Mm -hmm. Looked like he had achieved it all, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what he did? Mm -hmm. He went on a shooting spree, killed a bunch of people, mm -hmm. then shot himself. Mm -hmm. Why? Because although he was wealthy, he was poor mm -hmm. in spirit. Yes. All right. I know your work, your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews, or we could say Christians, and are not. But our synagogue of Satan, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. He's talking to those who were persecuted. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. There's good news, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for the good news. Which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw you into prison. Who? He didn't say the Democrats. Did he? <laughs> we got to know who our enemy is, church. Because if you don't know who your enemy is, you fight the wrong battle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So Jesus identified who the persecutor really is. That you may be tested, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Now, that 10 days, there's a lot of, of theories about that. Just know it's a period of time. You'll be thrown into prison for some time. Be faithful unto death. Wow. What good news. Be faithful unto death. I, look, I would rather hear Jesus say, be faithful, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to kick the prison door open, I'm going to snatch you out of that, and, and you're going to be a testimony. 
to the nations. Don't mess with a chosen child of God. That ain't what he said. He said, be faithful to death. And I will give you the crown of life. Wow. Let me tell you something. When we when we get to heaven, when we're there with God, and you see the mortars with their crown, they're going to be honored there like no other. You understand what I'm just saying? See that that where where it says the crown of life right there in the in the Greek, that's the word Stephanos. And what that is, that was the crown given to the winner of a race. So it goes back to what Paul said, I've run my race. I've finished my course. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's the spiritual death. He said, that though you might go through a physical death, you're not going to go through the spiritual death. Because I've already overcome that. And I'm going to give you a crown of life. And because I was the first raised up, you're going to be raised up to me with me also. Mm -hmm. All right. So wow. Smyrna, where this church was, was a, a business hub. It was where the rich people were. It was a wealthy part of town or a wealthy city. It was also an area of idolatry. There were numerous temples that had been built to Roman deities that were there. It was a place where the people let other things take the place of God. That's what's meant by idolatry. It's things that are worshipped in the place of God that aren't God at all. So an idol isn't just this image that's been carved out of stone or wood that people bow down to. An idol could be anything. Hey, we can make church an idol. There's a lot of people that do it. There's a lot in the ministry that they don't really serve God, they serve the ministry. And that's a real that's a that's a real challenge for a minister to not get, get so uh, uh, disillusioned in trying to do the work of the ministry that you let it replace the place of God in your life. But we can make a God out of ourselves. I saw somebody with a shirt on this week that said, I found the love of my life. It was me. <laughs> Be careful. Because we can make an idol out of anything. People make idols out of, out of careers. They make idols out of their family. They make idols out of a person. They make, idol, they make idols out of wealth. They make idols out of all kinds of things. It's hobbies. Hey, I've been guilty. I've, there's been hobbies in my life. Like I said, I'm a passionate person. And if I'm misdirected, I'm just as passionate about Something else as I am about God if I'm not careful. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. It's anything that we allow to take the place in our life, the place that God, the position God is supposed to hold. So where they were at was in a place where they, the people had a lot of wealth. Therefore, they worshipped a lot of things other than God. Because, you know, I have nothing against wealth. I, th I think we God desires that we all wealthy. I, I mean, I've got scripture to back it up. But he doesn't want us to be, he's not going to sacrifice us being wealthy for being right standing with him. He's not going to trust us with something that could destroy us. Amen. But his desire is that we all get to the place of spiritual maturity where he can trust us with wealth. Amen. You follow me? Yes. I don't know what I was saying, but I was going somewhere with that. Anyhow. They were in a place where these people had allowed money and all kind of other things to take the place of God in their place of worship. Jesus was telling them that they're about to go through some suffering, but do not fear. So the problem with that comes in when people worship things that aren't really God, it creates a void in them. And when they see someone who really worships God, it becomes offensive. So they want to stop it. I'm talking about our country right now. Mm -hmm. So when we have people in positions of power and authority who have no love for God, the when they see someone who is really passionately pursuing God, it creates in them a sense of conviction. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to feel conviction. Mm -hmm. 
They want somebody to tell them, hey, what you're doing is great. That's why there's such a, 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 there's such a push to get people not just to accept sin. They don't want you to accept it. They want you to celebrate it. You know what I'm talking about. They don't want you to say that, hey, I'm just not, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and not kill you for what you believe. They want you to say, I'm going to celebrate with you because of what you believe. Mm -hmm. Look, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. I, I, I don't hate you for what you do. I love you. I hate what you do, like the first one we right. the first letter we saw. I hate what you do, but I love you. Right. But that's not good enough for our society. They want you to say, not only do I love you, I love what you do. Amen. And I'm going to help you promote it. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to help you promote it. Sure. All right. But that's where this church was. So that's why he's telling them, expect tribulation. Expect that they're going to persecute you. Because you're doing things that make them, that point out their weaknesses and their flaws. And they don't like that. Therefore, they're going to retaliate against you to try to silence you. This has been going on for years, forever, forever around the world. But never here. Till now. Till in the recent past. So now the church in the United States is starting to feel some persecution because they're saying you can't say that anymore. You can't say that somebody's living their life the way they're living is wrong. Who are you to judge? I'm not. God did. I'm not arguing with you. God is. Take up your complaint with him, not me. Amen. Make sense? Yes. But I, I, I truly believe that in the upcoming future <laughs> that we're going to see more persecution. I would have never believed that the church in one day could have just about been silenced in America. But it, it did. We saw it happen, right? Well, how did we communicate? Well, we did it through social media and things like that. <laughs> well, now they're saying you don't say what we agree with, we're going to yeah. shut you down. Right. And they're doing it to people every day. Yes. So how long are we going to be able to communicate this way? I don't know. I don't know. But if you if you allow that to become how you regularly attend church and you depend on that, well, what happens to you when it's shut off? Mm -hmm. But do not fear. He said that he says that over and over. But do not fear. Don't fear. Let it cause you to have jubilation inside of you because you know that all, because all these things are happening, the day is getting so much closer when my God's coming back for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving right along like a herd of turtles. <clears throat> the compromising church. Revelation 2. Starting in verse 12. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, right? These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Oh, my God. That's Jesus, right? He said, my word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide all the way from the, the bone from the marrow. It separates things that are supposed to stay together, but it cuts a division right between them. And it can separate the truth from a lie. And honesty from dishonesty and the thoughts and the intents of the heart of man. Who else knows your thoughts and your intents? God don't not only know what you did, he knows why you did it. Even so, people might look at you and say, look how good they are. Look at the things that they're doing. God might look at you and say, yeah, but they're doing it just so they can be haughty and puffed up. Or whatever. Or it could be the other way. They're doing it because they love you. But God can separate the thoughts and the intent of the heart of man. I know your works and where you dwell. Where Satan's throne is. See, folks, Satan's not in hell. I don't know if you knew that. He's not in hell. He's here on the earth. Amen. Okay? And he's not everywhere. He's 
He's not omnipresent. Only God is. Satan can only be in one place at a time, but he's got a lot of help. Yes, he do. Remember, he took a third of the angels with him when he fell from, from grace and fell from heaven. He, went, no, he didn't fall from heaven. <laughs> Jesus said, man, I saw him. He was hurled <laughs> like lightning. He was chunked. All right. So you live where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. And did not deny my faith even in the days which Antipas, that's a cage, was my faithful martyr. He said, look, man, y'all didn't even deny the faith when they were killed before. Who was killed among you where Satan dwells? And he points it out again. But I have a few things against you. God! I was faithful to you when I saw them killing people for how they believed. But I still have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. There are those among you that believe something other than the truth. Okay? You got some idolaters among you who talk Balaam to put on a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things that were sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with a with sword in my mouth. They will stand as an enemy to my word. Mm. Who has an ear? Let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. That's supernatural supply. And I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name will be written, which no one knows except the one who receives it. That's your identity. That's a new identity in Christ, man. I'm not who I was. I'm who he's created me to be. Because now I have a new identity because I'm in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, man, that's good news. But he's talking about the compromising church. Where they were at was a political center. It was a political center. And it was also a satanic stronghold. They allowed the things from the pagan society to infiltrate the church. They allowed the things that the world does into the church. They allowed the things that they, now I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about us. They allowed the things of the world to come into them. They let what the world does affect what they do. So now there was no there was no distinct separation from how the world acted from the way they acted. Look, God doesn't have undercover Christians. We're not called to be undercover. He said no one lights a lamp and puts it under a blanket. That, does that make sense to you? You light a, blank, a lamp and then cover it with a blanket? He said you're the light of the world. What we're supposed to do is go out there and shine. We're supposed to illuminate. Not hide who we are, not cover up, not try to blend in. When we're trying to blend in and, and, and tell the world, look, I'm not that much different than you. Well, I should be, what, what comparison do you have between light and darkness? Can you, can you say there's so much alike? I can barely tell the difference. Can you tell the difference between light and dark? Yes. Sure. Yeah. But so much of the church, the body of Christ, we just blend in. And we can work with people for 20, 30 years, and they don't even know we're Christians. Can you imagine turning on a flashlight in a dark room full of people and nobody knows you turn the light on? You better check your batteries. You better check your bulb. You better question, do I really even have a light in my hand? So we can't be the church that compromises. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. 
But if the word offends you, that's not my problem. That's between you and God. If the truth offends you, well, you can try to change the truth. That doesn't work. Or you can change you. My advice is come into alignment with truth. If you want to live forever. Because the word of God lives forever. So if that's what you want to do, you need to come into alignment with that. You can rewrite the whole Bible. We can take that Bible and we can rewrite it. But it doesn't change the truth. We didn't change the truth. We just changed change what we say about it. Does that make sense? You can't, that's one thing about truth. Truth is unchangeable. That's why God said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because truth never changes. Facts change. Yes, facts change. So we got to learn to separate truth from fact. Okay? Facts change every day. The fact is, I'm 49. But come August 8th, that fact's going to change. What did I say? Yeah, I'm 49. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Yes, I'm 49. <laughs> so funny. I'm 49. Huh? But August 8th, that fact changes. And then I'll be 50. Okay? How'd that happen? That happened quick. The first 18, man, that took forever. <laughs> After that, that was quick. But look, this is what I'm saying. Facts change. Truth is unchangeable. You you can you can change what you say about it, but it doesn't change the truth. The word of God doesn't change. People can change how they preach it, but it doesn't change the truth. You understand what I'm saying? You can change the music, but that doesn't change a heart of worship. Someone who has a heart of worship can worship to the three little pigs. You understand what I'm saying? So you can't change the music to look more like the world because that doesn't change worship. True worship, the word the Bible calls it true worship, worship in spirit and in truth. You follow me. So we should be polar opposite. I'm not trying to blend in with them. I should make them want to change and become more like Jesus. Does that make sense? To you? Yes. So that's the word to the compromising church. And we, we cannot take the bait to start compromising our beliefs. Because truth never changes. Truth never changes. I, 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 if there's anything that you get out of this message, I want you to get that truth never changes. Jesus said, Father, your word, thy word is truth. That's truth. So when you find it in this written word, you can take it as truth. So truth always trumps a fact. That works out good for you. That works out good for you, child of God. Because when you find a promise in the Word, and there's over 5,000 that are in the Word, that are for you, that are stamped yes and amen in the blood of Jesus, already, they're, Terry Miles said they're not promises, they're purchases. They're things that God bought for you by His completed work on the cross. All right? So when you find one of those precious promises, and your life doesn't look like that, you can choose that. Because that's the truth, and it trumps the fact. You with me? Yes. The fact is, you might have got a diagnosis. The truth, it says, by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. Amen. Amen. I don't want to say that. Yes. The fact is, you might not have enough to pay your bills. But the truth says that God takes, prosper uh, takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. So you got to choose which one you grab a hold to, the fact or the truth. truth. Choose the truth. It 
last forever. Well, we could go on and on and on with the promises of God. You, you, could, you could say that, that you're still bound to a sin, and that, that might be a fact. But the truth is that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. The truth will make you free. Man, that's good.